On this edition of Veterans Health Watch, we'll talk about the risk factors, symptoms, treatment, and prevention of diabetes. We'll also hear from a veteran who's benefited from the VA's MOVE and diabetes prevention programs. Please join us. Welcome to Veterans Health Watch, a program sponsored by the Veterans Affairs Maryland Healthcare System that provides the latest health and benefits information for Maryland's veterans, their family members, and the local community. I'm Kenya Griffin. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 29 million Americans are living with diabetes. Joining us to talk about living with diabetes is Dr. Nanette Steinley, the Interim Chief for the Diabetes and Endocrine Section at the Baltimore VA Medical Center and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Steinley, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome, Kenya. Glad, glad to be here. So could you give us a, a simple definition of diabetes and why it often goes undiagnosed? Sure. Diabetes is a condition that occurs when the blood sugar, we also call it blood glucose levels, become higher than normal. A normal number would be typically between about 70 and 100, and when the blood glucose levels become higher than that, uh, we say they have pre a person has prediabetes. Once the number gets to 126 or above, that's a diagnosis of diabetes. If the blood sugar is tested fasting, that's especially important so that we don't have to be considered a, be concerned about whether or not you know, there's been food in influencing the blood sugar. Also, if a random glucose is tested in the middle of the day, for example, if the number is above 200, we also use that as a measure for saying someone has diabetes. And why does it go undiagnosed often? The problem is that with mild elevations in blood sugar, a person might be without any symptoms at all and not know that they have elevations. And the reason that we're concerned even about mild elevations in blood glucose levels is that the glucose deposits on proteins in our body. And then those proteins can't function properly and it causes damage to multiple sy systems. And I've heard of type one diabetes and type two diabetes. Can you describe the difference between the two and are there any other types of diabetes? There are, several types of diabetes. The type of diabetes that affects most people, the majority of the 29 million that you mentioned is type 2 diabetes. Type 2 often occurs in adulthood and often there's a family history. Usually a person is at risk if they're overweight, if they belong to certain ethnic groups. So for example, African Americans, Hispanics are more susceptible to type 2 diabetes for reasons that we still need to understand. Mm -hmm. A woman who had gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy is also more at risk for developing type 2 diabetes later on in life. If a woman has given birth to a baby that's greater than 9 pounds, that's also another risk factors. Age, smoking, um, are also risk factors. And so what we really hope that our listeners will understand is whether or not they're at risk for diabetes and when they should be checked. And, and are those risk factors mainly for type one or type two diabetes? The risk factors that I just mentioned pertain to type two diabetes. And you had asked me about type one diabetes, usually, but not always, type one diabetes is discovered in children. And the etiology of type 1 diabetes is thought to be autoimmune, which means there's something um, that triggers a, a response in the body uh, that the body sort of attacks itself. 
And in this case, in the, in the case of type 1 diabetes, the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin are, are destroyed um, by, by the body. And so the pancreas can no longer produce insulin. And insulin is an important hormone that allows blood sugar that circulates in the bloodstream to be taken up by the cells of the body and used for energy. And I, I didn't mention earlier, but I learned that at least 8 million of those 29 million people living with diabetes are undiagnosed. So can you tell us about some of the symptoms that are associated with diabetes? As I mentioned earlier, mild elevations in glucose may be undetected in terms of symptoms, but once the blood sugar becomes more elevated, the kidneys try to help remove some of the extra glucose from the body. And as a result of that, um, persons with high blood sugar may experience frequent urination, and they may feel thirsty. They may have blurry vision because the glucose affects the uh, fluid that's in the eye that allows us to perceive normal vision. Uh, sometimes they may have an infection or a sore that won't heal. Women, for example, may experience a vaginal yeast infection frequently or other uh, infections in, on the skin or other locations. Um, other signs that a person may have diabetes uh, may be fatigue or ir irritability. Okay, and when we talk about um, diabetes and lots of other health conditions, we always hear about exercise and diet to, that can be measures to prevent certain conditions. Is diabetes preventable and what can you do to help prevent it? There was a large study that was done a little over 10 years ago asking that very question. And what the study set out to do was to identify persons who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. And, and when I describe the study, I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, not type 1. Um, so they studied individuals who were overweight, whose blood sugar was mildly elevated, but not to the level that we would say they have diabetes, so a little higher than normal. And what was done is that in many centers, over 3,000 people were then randomly assigned to either intensive lifestyle, meaning uh, a healthy diet, it was based on low fat, uh, calorie restricted diet, um, and at least 30 minutes of moderate exercise. And in the study, most of the participants achieved about a 30 minute walk a day. So it wasn't extremely in intensive uh, physical activity. The other group was randomized to a medication that has been shown to be useful in helping improve insulin sensitivity and help control blood glucose called metformin. Another group was randomized to usual care and a fourth group, but that um, arm of the study was later discontinued, was assigned to another medicine. That medicine was taken off the market, and so um, that group was just followed prospectively. The results of the study were actually very encouraging. The study was meant to last for five years, and after three years it was stopped because the people that were in the intensive lifestyle group, healthy diet, exercise, slowed their progression to type 2 diabetes. And the risk reduction was about 60 percent. That's so pretty significant. It was, it was very, um, very significant and, of course, exciting for the study investigators to demonstrate that really having a, a healthy way of living is important um, for preventing onset of type 2 diabetes. And it was pretty simple. It, uh, like you said, just moderate exercise, 30 minutes of walking a day, not rocket science. Not really. rocket science. Those <laughs> small changes add up and really are meaningful over, over time. And that's what we need to hear. And what about a veteran who maybe has listened to the show and they notice maybe they have some of those risk factors or some of the symptoms? When should they contact a doctor? Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Um, first, there are websites that veterans can utilize to um, understand their risk a little bit. The American Diabetes Association um, has a, a risk factor uh, assessment that can be done. Um, but in general, I think uh, for the population at large, 
we start screening individuals at about the age of 40, unless they have other risk factors that would increase their risk. So a person who's 40 that's never had their blood sugar tested would be encouraged to speak with their primary provider about having their glucose tested. And we, we talked about this before, and well, you kind of touched on, on it a little bit. What about some of the other risk factors that are, not risk factors, but healthcare conditions that can be associated with diabetes or developed as a result of unchecked diabetes? The common complications from diabetes include damage to the eyes. So the, there are tiny blood vessels that provide the eye with oxygen and nutrients. And in the case of diabetes, when the blood sugar is elevated, those blood vessels are damaged and it causes the blood to leak and we call that retinopathy. Other complications related to diabetes include damage to the kidneys or nephropathy and the way that we check for that is with a, a urine test. We look to see if there is evidence of microscopic or very trace amounts of a protein called albumin. When the kidneys are exposed to diabetes, they sort of work over time initially. And that's what causes this trace amount of albumin to be present in the urine. If that's detected, then we look very closely at the blood pressure and make sure the blood pressure is well controlled in addition to the blood glucose. And there are certain medicines that can be prescribed that have been shown to reduce the likelihood that the damage to the kidneys would progress and become worse. Down the road, if it's left unchecked, th then that leads to the need for either dialysis or kidney transplant, and certainly we want to prevent that. Other common complications from diabetes include damage to the nerves. A person might experience unusual numbness or tingling, and often it happens in the extremities, the hands and the feet. And the reason for that is that the, the longer nerves tend to be damaged more readily than those that are um, shorter. And so that's why the feet um, may be affected first. And we're going to go to a break shortly. So if you could briefly tell me about the team approach to treatment for a, a veteran living with diabetes. So the team approach is very important. And the most important member of the team is the veteran. And in addition to having a healthcare provider who can assess the patient's need for medications, we have uh, registered dietitians, certified diabetes educators, pharmacists, uh, clinical pharmacists, psychologists that help us um, work with the veteran to establish a plan of care that is workable and doable for the veteran that achieves mutually um, agreed upon goals for treatment. Well, Dr. Steinle, thank you so much for joining us today and for educating us about diabetes. We hope that our viewing audience uh, appreciated and learned something today. I hope so too. Thank you for having me, Kenyon. Sure. We're going to take a short break, but when we return, we'll have more information about diabetes and treatment options. We'll also hear from a veteran, so please stay tuned. The Telephone Care Line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you've got a question about medication, diabetes, your, di your diagnosis, any concerns, you can always give us a call. People want to hear a live voice and not the machine. We're always there to answer your questions. Give us a call. 800-865-2441 and press 1 to speak to a nurse. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. A nurse is happy to help you. Did you know that Department of Veterans Affairs provides physical and mental health care for over 8 million veterans? Hi, I'm Natalie Dell. I may be an Olympic medal winner, but I know that real champions are those who have served this country. And VA knows that too. As a VA employee, I've seen the challenges our veterans face. I'm honored to be part of a team that supports veterans in achieving fuller, richer lives, and I invite you to join us in this rewarding experience. If you're a mental health provider, I urge you to visit vacareers.va.gov. Applying for the VA healthcare system is one of the best things you can do for your health and well-being. A lot of veterans, for some reason, don't realize that they are eligible for VA health care benefits. So we always encourage the veteran to call because each veteran is enrolled on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Once I obtained the knowledge that I could enroll, I enrolled, and it's been a great decision ever since. A veteran can learn more about eligibility for VA and health care at 1-800-463-6295, extension 7324. Welcome back to Veterans Health Watch. Joining us to talk about methods for controlling diabetes is Lillian Penault, a clinical dietitian for the VA Maryland Healthcare System, and Ann Adair, a U.S. Army veteran. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Lillian, earlier in the show we talked about a definition for diabetes, treatment, prevention, but can you talk to us as a registered dietitian, a dietitian to tell us how much nutrition and lifestyle plays into managing diabetes, especially with someone on diabetes medication? So sometimes people think that once they're on medications for diabetes, that nutrition and lifestyle no longer matter, which is certainly not the case. So having a consistent meal pattern, not skipping meals, these things can help keep blood sugar numbers more stable. They can also help diabetes medications work properly, and they can make it both easier and safer for medications to be adjusted when necessary. In fact, for some people, some of these lifestyle changes like eating healthier and increasing activity level, if you lose a little bit of weight, it may even reduce the amount of medication that's needed. So that's a great incentive to uh, live a healthier lifestyle. <laughs> and we always hear about carbohydrates, good carbohydrates, bad carbohydrates, who should have them, who shouldn't. Well, how, does the carbo how do carbohydrates play into uh, a diet of a person with diabetes? So there's a common misconception that people with diabetes need to avoid carbohydrates when in fact we need carbohydrates. They're the brain's preferred source of energy. So even for someone with diabetes, the goal is not to avoid them completely but rather to look at the types of carbohydrates that you're choosing, the portion sizes, and especially the timing. So this becomes particularly important if you're on certain types of medications, which can lower blood sugars. So let's say you're taking a medication which is designed to lower blood sugars in response to a meal. So if you don't eat that meal for some reason, or if you don't have enough carbohydrates at that meal, the medication is still going to do its job. So it's, but instead of lowering blood sugars from a high level to a normal level, it can reduce blood sugars down to a potentially dangerous level instead. So this is why timing and portion sizes is so important. If we want to look at the quality of carbohydrates, if you look at whole food sources of carbohydrates, things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, these foods tend to come packaged along with fiber and other nutrients, whereas the more processed carbohydrates, things like desserts, sweetened beverages, these are basically just providing sugar without any of the nutritional benefit along with it. Well, thank you, Lillian. <laughs> that was a, a show in, in and of itself. <laughs> and I understand that you all work together as a team to help develop a treatment plan along with the, with the veteran. Can you tell me how that how your role as part of the team is so important and how you work together with the veteran to help manage diabetes? Certainly. So a lot of times people are frustrated that they've heard the message over and over again about what they can't eat, when what they're really interested in finding out is what they can eat. So we really try to individualize it. So it's, it's partly an education piece on how certain foods affect blood sugars and how nutrition affects overall health but we really try to personalize the recommendations to take into account personal preferences, any medications that, that someone is on, and any other health conditions that they may be dealing with to come up with a nutrition plan. Any, any behavior change is an ongoing process, so it does take time, and we encourage them to come back for regular follow-up as well. And we talked about um, preventing diabetes. We just touched on that a little, or delaying it. Can you give us your perspective as a dietitian on preventing or delaying diabetes? Sure. So as Dr. Steinle previously mentioned, research has demonstrated that a 7% weight loss combined with exercise, 150 minutes of moderately intense activity per week, and improving healthy eating habits can delay or prevent diabetes, even in high-risk patients. So a lot of this has to do with lifestyle, and we certainly encourage veterans to take advantage of the various programs that we do offer at the VA to help with these, with these behavior changes. And can you describe some of the programs in a little more detail? Sure, so any veteran can request an individual appointment with one of our registered dietitians. There's no consult necessary, so they can just call the appointment line to set that up. There's also a comprehensive diabetes program within primary care, and that's a series of group classes that goes through nutrition and medical management of diabetes. 
And finally, for veterans with or without diabetes, if, if you're interested in weight management, the VA offers several different versions of the MOVE program. So there's the regular MOVE program, which is a series of weekly classes going through nutrition and behavioral health topics. There's also the TeleMOVE program, which basically offers the same information, but from the comfort of your own home. So if you're looking for the group dynamic, classes may be a better fit. If schedule doesn't permit, TeleMOVE can be a great option for some veterans as well. So those two programs are available at a variety of sites. So the appointment line for Baltimore would be a way to schedule, or veterans can check with their local healthcare team um, at, at their preferred site. The Diabetes Prevention Program is a subset of the MOVE program specifically for veterans with prediabetes. Currently that is only offered at Baltimore, and the first step would be to attend one of the MOVE orientation sessions. And since it's only at Baltimore, we certainly welcome veterans from other sites. If, if they're interested in, in coming to Baltimore, they're, they're welcome to do that as well. And you mentioned a couple of programs that I know Ms. Anna Dare has participated in. Thank you so much for joining us, Anne. And uh, you mentioned the MOVE program mm -hmm. and the pre-diabetes program. But could you first tell us a little bit about your military service? Mine is a little bit different than most veterans you'll meet. I didn't go into the military until I was 46 and um, because I'm a nurse and they allow nurses to come in and doctors to come in at a much later age. So it was really interesting to go to basic training with all these younger people. Um, but anyway, I started out as a reservist and um, was in a hospital unit and I had the opportunity to go to a different kind of unit called civil affairs. And this type of unit is responsible for helping a community get back uh, its normal act action and its community and civil actions. Uh, for example, if there's a war, uh, the civil, civil affairs people come in and help get bridges, roads, uh, the hospitals working again, electricity working, making sure the cattle don't have disease, chickens, whatever, um, and get people back into their normal work mode and their normal lives in their community. So that's what I did. Um, I was in a civil affairs unit. I, I, our unit was responsible for the Middle East and Africa, and I had a chance to go to many of those countries through uh, the civil affairs organization. Um, the last place I went was in Bosnia, and we were there to help get that community back uh, operating again, and um, it's still successful, and that was 20 years ago. Thanks to you, Ann. And could, so could you tell us what led you to seek services from the VA Maryland healthcare system? Well, I'm a retired VA nurse, first of all, and I've always felt the VA gave good care. But in 2004, I became service-connected, and I decided to come into the VA healthcare system. Um, the incident that caused me to come was my blood pressure was really high and the doctors in the community didn't seem to be aware that even though they knew my blood pressure was 200 over 90, nobody said we need to get you on medication or we need to change something. So I decided I'd come to the VA and that's, that's where I've been since then and I'm really happy. Good. Well, we're glad to have you at the <laughs> VA. And how did you become involved in the MOVE program and the pre-diabetes prevention program? Well, I knew I was overweight, and um, I had an A1, A, A1C done, and um, it showed me at the very bottom with a 5.8, but I decided that was close enough to diabetes that I needed to get involved. And that's where I met Lillian because she started the experiment. Um, I guess it was an experiment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pilot study. Pilot yep. study, that's a better <laughs> exactly. word. Uh, with a group that three people were in it. I was the one who stayed and finished and it was an excellent program. Really, in, And I'm back again uh, with the program. For me, it's helpful to have the group activity. Yeah, some people do prefer that exchange mm -hmm. with the group activity, yeah. the encouragement that comes from it. And what would you say to a veteran who maybe is on the fence about uh, receiving VA health care or, or participating in a program for additional support? Well, I'm always telling veterans to come to the VA. Um, 
no matter what their condition, I always say, come to the VA. Th there are people who don't want to come to the VA because they see the newspaper at things and they watch TV. But my experience in the last 10 years being at the VA has been very positive. Um, and I tell people about that and talk with them about what their condition might be and tell them who to contact and how to get involved. And how has this program helped you directly as far as um, preventing or delaying diabetes or just your overall health? Well, for me, the big thing is to monitor my diet and to increase my exercise. Um, I don't get out and exercise as much as I should. <laughs> Lily and I have talked about that, yeah. <laughs> And um, it really does encourage me to do that and to watch what I'm eating. I don't think that I overeat all the time, but it's just enough that my weight stays the same. And the exercise is really important. Great. Sounds like you've learned a lot from the program. <laughs> and Lillian, how would a veteran who's enrolled in the healthcare system go about participating in this program? So the MOVE program is a self-referral program. So any veteran that's interested can call the call center to request an appointment or to call their, their local clinic if they're looking at one of the alternate sites. So if they're interested in the diabetes prevention program subset of the MOVE program, then the first step would be to attend one of the MOVE orientation sessions. And if people are not sure whether they might be at risk for diabetes, we even have a mechanism to help get people screened. So we can check blood sugars, see if that's a program that would be appropriate for them. And, and they'll find out all the different options of MOVE at that orientation session. So that's a great start. And what about a website or other reference materials available for veterans who, and their family members who want to learn more about diabetes and diabetes prevention? Well, one of the first places I would recommend looking would be the website for the MOVE program which is www.move.va.gov. Um, the National Institutes for Health also has a lot of information on diabetes, or veterans could look at eatright.org. Um, so those would be some that come to mind. That's great. Well, Lillian and Anne, thank you so much for joining us. You've given us great information and inspiration for our veterans. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks. Well, that wraps up this edition of Veterans Health Watch. If you have questions about today's show or would like to make suggestions for future topics, please call us at 1-800-463-6295, extension 7101, or visit us on our website at maryland.va.gov. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And remember, if you are a veteran or you know a veteran who is not using the VA Maryland healthcare system, please encourage them to stop by one of our medical facilities, Visit us on our website or give us a call at 1-800-463-6295, extension 7324. We look forward to serving you. Please join us next time. There are numerous benefits for a veteran to enroll in the VA Maryland healthcare system. Number one, it's they get excellent health care. There's a great pharmaceutical service. They have uh, specialists in, in all of the areas and use cutting edge technology. And we have a very good electronic medical health record. You, you can keep your current provider as well as come to the VA. For our veterans, no matter whether they live in Central Maryland or Eastern Maryland, our clinics are conveniently located to where they live throughout Baltimore and the Eastern Shore. The fact that there are other veterans here that I can talk to and, uh, and share experience, common experiences with. The, the, the amount of uh, med uh, medical attention that I received has been excellent. The VA Maryland Healthcare System is the, your VA. It's America's VA. It's the veterans' VA. Since I've enrolled at the VA, it has been a great decision and I encourage every veteran um, to enroll. It, they will not regret it.